Um, so the scariest thing about being asked uh, towards the end, uh, Dan and I being asked uh, to co-chair was to lead this session. Uh, Dan actually very nicely, we've both been taking separate sets of notes, but his, I think, are more organized around major points. And so he kindly agreed to uh, use his laptop while we have this discussion. Um, and just as a reminder, I think everyone remembers that we're going home tonight. So unlike some of these workshops, um, this is kind of our, as opposed to the second day being everyone comes back and synthesizes things. This is our chance um, to synthesize. And since we're ahead of schedule, um, that should leave ample time. Um, so Dan, I think you were going to walk through some of what you consider major points, and then we'll open them up for discussion. Yeah, so, so right. this is um, what I thought were the uh, notable observations and recommendations through the day. And let me just sort of scroll through, the, uh, in case you didn't see yours on the first screen since we're, uh, is it was organized by ev evidence generation, really the topics of each of our panels, evidence generation, data analysis and interpretation opportunities, uh, reporting and return of results, assessment of the effects, oh good, I get to type wrong, uh, correct spelling errors, assessment of the effects of return of results, and then the overall discovery to translation process. So these are things at the level of just how eMERGE has run to date over the last decade. So let me go back up to the top and then. And I think you combined electronic phenotyping with evidence, right? Uh, yes, uh, so evidence generation opportunities. So phenotyping is one form of key form of evidence used by that. So I roll those together and um, so the opportunities, uh, and again, this was focusing not so much on operations or the way that historically uh, eMERGE has done things, but on uh, ways that things might be different. So, so Dan, is it possible for you to project that on the WebEx? You, all you have to do is get on the WebEx and then share your screen. Okay. Because it, this is like a really important thing to capture and for people to be able to see. Okay, yeah. So let me just go ahead and open the network login page. Somehow I got logged off. So let, let me log in. And I, and I won't do this for all of you. Let me I'm just gonna unplug <laughs> until I get back to where I was. And if so, somebody actually. Right, so while he's is, doing. I actually probably still have it in my in my other email, so let me see if I've got it. Uh, so while he's doing that, for the electronic phenotyping, were there specific points that people felt came out of that discussion? Um, they're probably on his list, but in case they're not, that so, you know, I got the WebEx. And you got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me click on the link here and get started. But she thought, if you want to come up and make sure that I do this in the right order, and you may have the login and stuff. Can I just bypass that? Oh, I can't. I can't. Uh, I'll put in your email. Sure. <laughs> no, that's right. Okay. Oops. Okay. Good thing we're ahead of time. Well, Sharon, you had asked about were there were there points right. about electronic phenotyping, and and I did want to ask um, somebody. I think it was Ken raised the concern that that there weren't any um, uh, EMR vendors at the you know at this meeting, and we right. always struggle with this um, because how do you bring one without bringing you know many? Right. Um, and if you had any suggestions on the best way of of doing that, that would be wonderful to hear. I, I would say in Caesar we struggled with this as well. Um, because of the idea that we had to have at least several of the major vendors. Um, and we at least had some phone calls where we had different vendors represented on different calls, but, but I would agree that that was the issue. Dan, you probably have more experience with this. Did you have your hand up, the, Dan? There are empty okay. seats at the table now. You can. Uh, no, can I, let me go back to also sharing here. Well, just to say, I mean, we did in Emerge as well had um, at least one meeting where we had the major EHR vendors, Cerner, okay. Epic, and uh, GE come. It. And it, it, it's limiting because they don't want to talk in front of each other. So there's also that problem that you have to face. Uh, so they were look, really looking to us to tell them what to do. 
So just to tell Dan, it doesn't quite look like what you're showing. So, so if you can see this, um, we still we're still seeing your your you know choice oh. of screen, and we're okay. Seeing, I yeah. think you have to select that window. Okay. Ooh. Oh, that's wait good. a minute. This doesn't um, no, canceling no, a no, shutdown. No, look, that's, cancel. Hey, yeah, I was going to say <laughs> no, we don't want to do this. We don't want to do this. And what I do want to, I have to get rid of this problem that I'm, I'm disconnecting the projector. Okay. Yeah, that's where I was, was duplicate, but apparently it left. Uh, okay. Am I still sharing my screen? Uh, but now it's not up here. Oh. Yeah, what, what, what the technical issues are being worked out, so. Yes. Um, I think you could just invite everyone, right? And like, if they don't come, they don't come. Uh, one way to quote unquote invite everyone is go through the EHR association, okay. uh, where they, they'd be happy to be the middleman and say, hey, you know, we'll put a call out. Um, the question of whether they come and whether they engage, I think depends on sort of whether they, you, they view the use case as really important. Uh, some vendors may already have a genomics working group. So at the very least, you should be able to get them to join uh, remotely, I, I think. A lot of vendors, they'll, I mean, they'll just make a cost benefit analysis of is it worth actually sending a person? Well, no, I was going to edit it. They have to pay their way to or whatnot. But, but I think okay. the WebEx kind of option definitely opens up more people to potentially come. Um, I think it's hard with that notion of vendors don't want to tell each other or what's going on. That might be sort of separate discussions with specific vendors, including the vendor's customers. And if you sort of pull the eMERGE sites, I assume that it's primarily going to be two vendors anyway. So you can just have, you know, two vendors that you have separate calls with. What's as long as Dan's working on it, it's a generic problem. It's not just the EHR vendors. It's the, uh, you know, there are two large genomic uh, or genotyping sequencing vendors, and you can't invite one without inviting the okay. other, and they don't want to talk in front of each other. And, oh. and there are and there's a, only about a million companies that are trying to develop. Uh, you know, software solutions for all the stuff we're talking about here. Who do you invite and who do you not invite? So I, I'm happy to be talking amongst ourselves for a while. But I, I, your idea of going through a, a trade organization is not a bad one. That's that's worth it. Okay. <laughs> Oh, you know what happened? Stop sharing. Connect the computer and then share. Oh, okay. That's what happened. All right. Okay, so let's um, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, well, is that? So now it's only on the projector. Well, it's. No, don't, don't, oh, oh, I see. Uh, I took it away from myself. Okay, so suddenly. No, oh, so duplicate. All right, we got a weird formatting problem. Duplicate. Yeah. Okay, now you can share. Your All right, now, now share, share my screen. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 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 Where were we? <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, highlighted among the evidence generation op opportunities were um, the, the general category of better phenotyping methods and technologies. And, and first among them, increasingly automated phenotyping, since it was clear it just doesn't scale, it's too labor intensive, and so better ways to do this that are increasingly automated. But the, it incorporated elements such as the ability to do longitudinal phenotyping, uh, particularly with respect to exploiting time to create more accurate phenotypes, uh, the ability to um, find uh, not just binary states, absence or presence of disease, but rather a continuum of states um, included within that, um, in a lot of cases, the ability to infer hidden physiological phenotypes, and uh, a recurring theme throughout each of these, the application of machine learning methods, including 
um, the uh, learning of these uh, of latent states using deep learning methods and um, issues that would accommodate the bias that's known to occur across institutions and within institutions um, in the clinical data. Uh, uh, yeah, I would just emphasize the continuum of states. I think that was a recurring theme that you need to encode both to the degree and the severity, um, and that that may also make it more attractive um, it, to physicians if you're not simply just saying disease, no disease, but perhaps a genotype predicts the severity of an illness. And could I ask before you before you go on from there. So increasingly automated phenotyping is something that we've been saying for low these 10 years, um, if, if not longer. Um, so have we made progress in the past four years on, on increased automation? And I would ask the, the Joshes and George. I, I mean, that, that example I showed from Harvard that Sean has, I mean, that was the, the hard work was creating the 300 cases, but then the thing was at 0.96 or point something around 0.95 um, PPV at the end of it. So that, so, so you still had the hard, we're doing research into how to reduce the number of cases you need to achieve that. So that's still state of the art, but machine learning, we're already evaluating a hundred cases for the, I mean, um, curating a hundred cases just to do the evaluation. So if we increase to 300, we we're able to learn a spectacular phenotype. I mean, that's not bad. How long did it take to do the whole phenotype, Sean? Like a minute, yeah. I'll repeat what he says. How long did it take to re to curate the 300 cases? I guess is the question. Well, it happened over a long period of time. And <laughs> we stopped and started, and then stopped and started. Right. Beth, what would you say? Yeah. Stopped and started about three months. I mean, because you know, you'd be like, oh, well, no, we need some more cases. Oh, no, we need some more cases. So. Um, so it takes a, you know, I mean, the, the other thing is, of course, we're exploring these new kinds of ways that we can use fewer cases and then use kind of a cluster method, what we call a silver standard, to put the kind of initial set of um, uh, attributes that we can use out of the box, which are really like counts of ICD-9 codes and counts of mentions of synonyms of the diseases. And that gives you kind of a, something that's close. And then you apply this denoising algorithm to pull in the rest of your stuff while diminishing that. that. And you, you can get this increasingly in an automated fashion that I think uh, Josh has actually been writing about. So. Exactly, so silver standards and then Peggy slide on active learning are kind of where we're headed to try to reduce that curation time. Can I, I just want to break that problem into a couple of parts too. So the other part is how long does it take to transport it from one place to another and how much work does it take to get all the covariates out? I think we've actually done a big step forward with what we're doing with the covariates across the entire set. Um, and I think that will make a lot of those a lot, you know, trivial to get as opposed to each of us running things. And, and you know, the other thing that, and then, and then moving towards a common data model should actually make, you know, everything but the NLP, I think, um, relatively much more plug and play transporting instead of all the time we spend implementing something. But so those things have sped up. You know, if we talk back in Verge 1, we're talking about a year to 18 months per phenotype. I think it takes us less than that when we're actually working on things now. So considerably, I mean, we, you know, we're, we're but, trying but we to do said, but, how, many, how many phenotypes right. we're only halfway through and we're two years right. in. So, the, the, so, a lot of us spent, our phenotyping team spent time doing, picking our sequence examples too. So, so those didn't necessarily count as phenotypes, but they were phenotypes things that we were doing. But, um, the, uh, but the other component is our phenotypes are getting harder. Like, I'm not sure that, that things like, like the statin mace algorithm or some of these others that we've done, you know, we don't really know generally how to do those in a grab bag machine learning fashion yet. So it, it's, 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 new, it's new work. Okay, I, I think, the, can I just comment? The other thing, Terry, is if you look at the phenotypes, the more recent phenotypes are much more complicated more complicated, so there's a big difference there compared to Emerge One. Okay. So the, I, I think we don't want to rehash the whole day, so we we should keep going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have to. So a, a short comment, and that is that, that we're, we're, we're obsessed by saying how many phenotypes have we done? Well, you know, ages of phenotype and 
gender is a phenotype, and the highest cholesterol you've ever had measured is a phenotype. So we have a million phenotypes. And the phenotypes you're talking about are the complicated ones. So it's, it's, it's not finding diabetes. I think we've, we've cracked that part. It's finding the diabetics who then take a medicine, who are then, then have a biomarker measured, and then, and then go blind. And so those are the complicated ones. And, and so I think we're, we're developing the standard methods to do that, and, and at the same time exploring these newer methods, the machine learning and, and what have you. And, and, and so I, I think it's, it's uh, um, a little unfair to say, well, you only have done 40 phenotypes, or you've only done 27 phenotypes, or 46 phenotypes, or whatever, because I think we've done a lot more than that. And the, the phenotyping group does a lot of other things that they're not recognized for, like picking out patients who we're going to study and what have you. So I, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not on the phenotype working group, but I obviously have an interest in that. But concrete example, autoimmune phenotype, 43 separate diseases being identified. So is that one phenotype or 43 phenotype? It tells you which of 43 diseases you have. So that took several months to create, but it's 43 different diseases that we would have in the old days called 43 phenotypes. Impressive. Uh, still, it, it's, but it is still the case that the diagram of how it's done looks just like the eMERGE-1 diagram of how it's done. And when you compare 175 to the 8,000 diseases that human beings get plus, uh, growing uh, <laughs> in the era of a rare variance, it uh, looks like we're falling behind. So uh, other discussion. Uh, I, mean, I think holding out uh, the notion that there could be entirely different approaches to phenotype extraction seems like a good thing, uh, rather than just optimizing that you can row even faster in the next iteration than you're rowing now. OK. Uh, you'll see the new data sources re re are, are interlaced through multiple methods here, but uh, one we heard in the context of better phenotyping was um, the, the ability to um, do phenotyping based on gene by, vi by environment interactions. Um, and on the outgoing side uh, of evidence, uh, that is eMERGE as a source of evidence for ClinGen and other genomic medicine resources, as, as well as uh, these uh, novel uh, sources that are outside of eMERGE now. So incorporation of environment, direct-to-consumer, genomic data, social media. We just heard the notion of peer-to-peer -peer phenotyping uh, as, as it exists in the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. Family history and other patient-reported measures, online disease-focused uh, patient communities. All of those are sort of new classes of data, but they actually have special relevance to the topic of phenotyping, and that's why they're included here, but you'll see them other, under other headings as well. Dan, I would just add to that, the, the, you know, with the geocoding, I think we do have, uh, we saw at least one slide about that today, we do have the opportunity to really execute on the environment piece, not, you know, in probably a pretty robust way, but certainly with lots of work to be done. Okay, so we'll put environment, especially in the context of uh, geocoding. Okay, other comments about evidence generation. Again, we rolled up two panels in that one. Okay, then uh, turning to data analysis and interpretation opportunities, um, and we've heard um, these throughout each of the panels. Uh, the first is the notion of, uh, that we just heard from Heidi of real-time variant interpretation that incorporates some of these other new data sources, such as patient data, as well as the traditional way of, of matching publicly available knowledge sources to the patient's uh, own variants. The methods to, uh, and, and this one a major issue, since so little is known about genomic medicine now, and that is methods uh, to efficiently do continuous data reinterpretation over time. Um, is front and center as a challenge for uh, this consortium, but all the other genomic medicine consortiums as well. Um, Semi-automated to fully automated interpretation via analysis pipelines, for which there are some promising early developments. Uh, methods for assessing pathogenicity and variant penetrance, uh, such as fa family cascade testing, 
um, and the application of these methods to address this sort of these fundamentally difficult problems in complex uh, traits of pathogenicity and variant penetrance. Uh, methods for efficient uh, collaboration with other research consortia, particularly uh, we heard earlier today for pragmatic trials and rare variant characterization. And, uh, and we just heard this sort of the opportunity for e eMERGE to add a genomic dimension to other research programs, <clears throat> such as all of us MVP, or all of us as, as the archetype for that, not MVP. Um, all of that, critically, we've heard through the day, depends upon standards-based data exchange. So that needs to be a kind of fundamental be bedrock of, of eMERGE as it, <clears throat> as it moves forward. Um, the opportunities to do um, public health genomics, we heard in our uh, novel and disruptive uh, technologies, uh, including the, the linkage of eMERGE data to health information exchanges. Uh, formal approaches to representing and accommodating uncertainty in the analysis and uh, interpretation of the data. Uh, big omics data linkage, uh, uh, if Takar mentioned this. Uh, so the, the joining of EMR-derived phenotypes with other classes of omics uh, data. Uh, the inferring of genotypes, we heard this from Matt, of um, Inferring genotypes from non-traditional data sources, such as drug experience, images, inter even internet search histories. So these as supplements um, to, to basically um, help triangulate on, uh, on genotypes uh, and their relationship to uh, real world manifestations. The application of deep learning to the characterization of uh, variants of unknown uh, significance. Uh, and uh, specifically, we heard from Matt, drug targets and toxicity predictions associated with uh, the, the primary genomic data. Uh, we've heard a variety of um, speculation about how we might do either crowd or cloud-based annotation <laughs> methods, <laughs> uh, crowd-sourced and cloud-sourced. And then uh, high-performance computational methods. So things that are simply uh, are within reach now with uh, advanced supercomputers that were no longer were not previously computable. They were just sort of transcomputable. So um, I'll stop there for others' observations about um, new opportunities in data analysis and interpretation that they had in mind, or they heard, or this wasn't actually the right version of what was said. <laughs> Well, Dan, I think after we do this, I think we should go back a little bit to evidence generation because we talked about the phenotyping, but there was a lot of discussion about cost effectiveness versus clinical actionability versus that I think we need to capture uh, as well. But why don't we should go through this and some of it okay. I think is captured in here. Okay. So other comments on that, uh, that general topic of data analysis and interpretation? And again, this is um, the new opportunities where we think there's um, um, a grounds for eMERGE to really um, make progress in, uh, in areas, that, some of which are quite novel. Okay, so let's then move on. Well, so if, if yes. no one else will, I'm happy to. Um, so, so Sandy talked about um, one of the challenges with uh, uh, accessibility of clinical data, that if physicians have to spend 20 minutes finding something, they're not going to, to do it. And is there a way that we can make, you know, use NLP or other tools to synthesize information and present it to the clinician at the point of care when they need it? So Sandy, I may be paraphrasing you wrong, but isn't that what you were trying to yeah, the, the, one, the one thing that I'd modify is I don't actually think it requires NLP. I think it requires just pulling the data from the different sources. Where is that? Into one place to use. Yeah, so a variety of tools uh, to synthesize and present at point of care. Yes, Jesse. Um, about the clinical decision support. Um, I think Sharon made a point earlier about how uh, many people have all of their care in many different places. And so until we solve the interoperability, clinical decision support is going to be at a huge disadvantage because there's just going to be data, no matter how good you are about looking at the data that's in the system, there's a lot of data not in the system that would be yeah, impactful so, on that decision. So CDS is coming up next. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe we're th we, maybe we're there. No, we're, it's coming up next. Too late. Too so late. data analysis interpretation was different than CDS, but save that comment <laughs> and go find a mic. <laughs> Josh, Did we already passed evidence generation. By or, yeah, so in evidence generation, so um, I, I think it's worth spending a few moments thinking about uh, pre-coordination of study design, which by that I mean in our current iteration of Emerge, we have. A lot of different study designs. Some of them are fairly naturalistic. Uh, some of them are RCTs. We kind of have a whole. Would you mind picking up the mic? You're kind of going in and out. Thanks. Okay. So my point is that right now we have a, a wide spectrum of study designs across the different institutions in Emerge Three, and I think um, if we are going to pre-coordinate a study design for the next iteration, it's going to have to be in the RFA. Right, and I think this gets into the some of the general themes from the evidence generation, so maybe this should be a separate bullet point, that we need to come to terms on what are effective cost-effectiveness research in genomics, what are standardized forms for clinical trials, both for what you're talking about, but also for clinical utility. In many other aspects of medicine now, there's like a checkbox and you say, I'm following this format. Um, and someone has given some deep statistical thought to those formats in advance, which I don't think we have yet. And so that relates to having more standardized forms across the consortium and also across other consortiums. I just wouldn't use the term coordinate. Um, because I, I, the point that I made earlier was that different study designs looking at the same problem in different ways is actually stronger. So it's more of a synthesis of different study designs. So if you have a pragmatic trial in Ignite and you have an observational study in Emerge uh, looking at the same issue, uh, that could provide uh, different sets of data that would be useful in terms of the um, uh, generation of evidence. If it's, a, if it's a standardized format for which there's been some serious thought that the study design itself is going to provide. That, I think, was intrinsic to my comment, but I, I accept that as an explicit uh, well, amendment. Well, I would say genomic medicine is, I mean, I, I also spent a lot of time in clinical cancer trials, and they're very specific designs, and people have given much statistical thought to how you do those, and people will compare across designs, but we're in a new phase here that I, that I think does not always lend itself to the same degree of... of Infrastructure. The extension that I would make to this is that uh, one of the things that PCORI has done is that they've actually funded methodology. Um, that they, um, we may not have all the methods available to us that we need to do the types of studies. The N of 1 was a particular issue that Eric had brought up earlier. And so um, is there a, um, uh, a place in this for uh, funding novel methodologies to address these problems? Okay. Yes, uh, wait, I, and can I just add to that? You know, I, I think one of the problems, and it's a debate, I don't know the answer, but, you know, standardization only works when you know what the right answer is. And I'm not sure we know what the right answer is yet. So I think there is still some value to sort of experiments between different places doing different things. So we, we need to make sure that we've sort of gotten 80% through that space of those kinds of experiments before we say, okay, we're going to lock in on a particular design or even a particular set of designs. And, you know, I'm agnostic about where we are in that spectrum, but we need to at least have the discussion about have we hit the point of diminishing returns of doing those experiments between different strategies versus too much standardization. So I think it's just a balance that we need to pay attention to. Okay, so shall we put... But but not too much. Well, but then I think we. Well, but I think that I think this gets back to Mark's comment then. That I think we have to have thoughtful ways in which those different methods are being attempted, so that we don't just wind up with heterogeneous study designs without a real reason. Attempted and evaluated. Yeah. Um, we, we've been saying throughout Emerge 3 that we have been doing, we've been actually experimenting with a variety of different ways of doing a variety of different things, and we can use that to learn from it. I think that we ought to begin to synthesize some of the lessons. So I'm, I, I would concur with 
not so much the rigidity of standardization, but by the time we're beginning Emerge 4, we ought to have some ideas of best practices, of uh, best ways to do things. OK. Uh, we can return to that when we go ahead and move on to um, the reporting and return of results. Um, uh, where I'm not exactly sure where collaboration dropped into this topic. It doesn't seems like it, it, it uh, transcends uh, lots of them, but it, uh, uh, it's focusing particularly on uh, EHR integration. So this was the panel that focused on uh, CDS and uh, the, that there are opportunities for uh, user-centered design for, in, in both the creation of, dis, of display-centered and event-based um, CDS for specific conditions, but also along with that, a, um, a, a reasonable mandate to, to build foundations uh, that promote shareable eCDS. And uh, embedded within them are the challenges of knowledge representation of complex decision support, knowledge uh, objects, and that was put in the context particularly of, of open source um, specifications for those. And um, uh, determination, that is the assessment of genomic CDS that embodies deep knowledge rather than simple rules that are the sort of superficial drug-drug um, uh, interaction style CDS that causes such high rates of overrides and annoyance, uh, as well as the next issue, which was confronting alert fatigue and other, I generalize that to other usability issues for uh, genomic CDS. Uh, we heard uh, about this uh, opportunity slash tension about having uh, viewing externalized CDS services uh, as, an, as essentially an ancillary system. So whether you run it inside connected to your own executables or you call a, a, a web service is um, kind of one of the designs of experiment, uh, it, uh, an experiment that, that, that eMERGE could well do because of its technical sophistication in creating CDS and uh, its track record of having done it in its own institutions, as well as understanding the evolving technologies by which you do um, these um, uh, cloud-based uh, services. Um, another version of that was the idea that you would have genomic apps as supplements uh, to clinical systems. And if I heard it correctly, that included the idea that you might have sort of natively executable um, uh, code for Epic or the three, two or three major systems where you could actually just plug it in if you wanted to own and operate um, the CDS service. And um, the incorporation in clinical decision support of provider preferences for those that give their decisions support to providers. The next one, um, the major topic there uh, was actually um, part of the disruptive and novel ones, and that is direct to participant or patient technologies for communicating both the data and the interpretation of the data that confronts the problem, the fundamental problem of non-scalable limited resources for expert consultation. So the use of uh, board certified uh, genomic medicine specialists and or genetic counselors just doesn't scale uh, to uh, broadly to a community setting. So the uh, uh, confronting that, that how much of this can you automate the delivery not only of the data and its interpretation and do that in a way, uh, particularly as uh, with, with participant facing or patient facing technologies that is sensitive to health literacy, that incorporates, in this case, patient preferences, as, as just as we incorporated provider preferences in the clinical system. And we heard specifically the facilitation of family sharing uh, as a goal uh, that could be um, uh, addressed in this direct to participant um, mode of uh, communicating results. So let me stop there. And uh, oh, a whole bunch of hands. But you were first, and then you're next. So I just <clears throat> want to respond to the genetic counselor lack of um, workforce issue. I think I'm the only genetic counselor here. 
Um, but I, but I do think it's, um, you know, I understand that's an issue that's talked about a lot. But I think rather than just saying that there is a problem with workforce, we also need to address how we um, responsibly return and deliver results. It's not just about a workforce. It's about what's the right information to get to patients and what's the right way to do it. Um, what's information that we can maybe use other kinds of technologies to deliver the information. Um, what does need a counseling one-on-one -on -one session. So I, I guess I'm just looking for a little bit of a, a deeper thought process about and, that. And you'll see it in the next heading, <laughs> which happens to be assess some of the effects of return of results. Uh, I think actually you're, you're next. So I agree that the, I think the consensus of the group was that the, the notion of shareable CDS across different um, groups and that being foundational infrastructure was, was something that we want to do. Um, but I, I think Ken's point is really important for us to, to, to capture the idea that there will need to be resources that go into that and therefore that, that probably implies that we need to narrow our scope to a particular kind of CDS. And I just want to just I just want to make that point that that we do need to in some ways focus, and I think that that's the implication of choosing to do this kind of sharing. Yeah. So this actually isn't an implementation group. I mean, we're, if you if you were in the business of writing FOAs, if one would ever be written, you, you'd actually want to create it in such a way that pe people would thoughtfully look at that and say, well, one of the things I have to con confront is is constraining the problem so it becomes doable. So I would put that more on the respondent side than on crafting an FOA that predetermines there should some, be some uh, way of uh, addressing that issue, because I, I think it is a general issue in, when you've just got too much to tackle at once. <clears throat> so um, to, to address Maureen's issue about genetic counseling and how it uh, can be applied, it would seem to me that the genetic counselors would become application experts for how to use these uh, technologies and to make sure that they are done as well as we possibly can do them uh, at the same time uh, provide scaling. It's a small community relative to all the information that's going to be there. And people are going to really struggle to swim in all of the kinds of data they can find. And to have someone that can guide them through it will be really, I mean, guide them through it, maybe not necessarily person to person so much as the uh, modern way of doing it through social media connections. Yeah, and, I, and actually, you know, I, I intentionally said provider preferences. That's, that's all the providers who would be using this, including probably, yeah, pri probably. primarily, uh, you know, counselors, not, not so much. Well, at ASHG, uh, last week or two weeks, whatever, uh, there were actually a couple of population-based examples, one from Israel and one from the UK, where they're really limiting the use of genetic professionals to the individuals with positive results um, and showed data on a couple of different uh, trials of using uh, pre, uh, short uh, educational uh, materials for physicians and patients for consent, very short kind of negative results, and then at least in one way, I mean, we still probably can't scale that but there was, there was some data from a couple different countries showing they could pretty effectively utilize the expertise of the genetic counselor specifically for individuals with positive results for high penetrant gene in, in population scale testing. Yeah, and one other quick thought, just on, on the foundation layer. Um, it, it came up a couple times about knowledge repositories and the, the existing work that can be built upon. I think CDS implementers will be attracted if, if there's sort of that dimension as well, and then that can be made translated uh, into, you know, focused pilot projects or use cases. So enhancement of existing, knowledge. enhancement of existing knowledge repositories. May I add something about the genetic counselor? Yes. Yeah, at the ASHG, uh, this speaker present a randomized clinical trial for return results be, between genetic counselor and the web of return. And uh, he found for, for 500 people or something like that, 
uh, there's no significant significant difference between genetic counselor return results and the web uh, return of results. For what kinds of results? I mean, for positive and negative? Uh, for, I think it's for positive, both positive and negative. Huh. Okay. Okay. No more? Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that all the things that we've sort of brought out here are really um, getting at the issue that we need clinical reengineering. Uh, that this is really about how we can get out of the traditional way of doing things and into a new paradigm that actually will scale and will be reliable. And, and so this, again, comes back to, uh, to me, the fundamental question for Emerge 4, which is, you know, should we really embrace that idea and say that this really needs to be about implementation science and clinical reengineering as opposed to uh, iterating a against yeah. something where we know what the barriers are and we're going to inevitably uh, come up against those barriers if we continue to try and do the same thing. Okay, well actually we're gonna get down to overall discovery the translation process and, and uh, implementation science and such at, uh, there. So uh, thank you for reminding me we have two more topics to go. <laughs> and, and the uh, next one is the assessment of effects. And I, it, we sort of anchored it on the, the effects of the return of results um, but it's, I think, a more general um, assessment of, uh, of effects. <clears throat> uh, the first uh, idea that we heard uh, actually attended to your presentation of uh, presenting uh, PDFs as the, uh, um, uh, the forms at which you'd capture data to assess uh, outcomes is the opportunity to do, uh, develop, uh, as is really as part of phenotype uh, specification is the phenotypes that represent outcomes and process measures are themselves, in essence, detectable phenotypes in many cases. And I connected that to the notion that that really um, satisfies the criteria for what's called closed loop decision support, where you give the, the guidance and then you just, in, you don't have to have a separate a case chart review to see whether it was followed. You actually prime the next part of the rule to detect the good and the bad outcomes that might uh, result. So it's a form of, it would reinforce the idea of a closed loop CDS and particularly would help inform at a national level a learning healthcare system um, because it has the attractive property that you learn whether or not the users follow the guidance. <laughs> All right, so uh, the general notion of the evaluation of the effects of clinical decision support is prominently featured we heard just now in the most recent session that correlation of attitude and beliefs with the actions taken by recipients of results in their interpretation, an important, uh, uh, I think, frontier for uh, uh, assessing the effects of uh, return of results. Wearables as a source of quality of life data um, and uh, the ability to do sentiment and mood analysis uh, as a subset of uh, looking at the effects of return at results. Um, the uh, financial impacts as uh, experienced by either health systems and or patients. Um, the evaluation of um, uh, patient engagement uh, with science. So that, viewing that as an, act, as an outcome of an intervention that a, that a patient becomes more engaged with in uh, the science of understanding their own disorders uh, as a measurable effect. Um, the development, uh, the spontaneous, if you will, development of communities as a consequence of genomic medicine findings become, becoming available. Uh, the evaluation of the effect of, of both standard and non-standard uh, uh, approaches to delivering results on provider-patient relationships. Right, so encoded in that is that you'd have traditional provider-focused um, CDS. Does that change provider-patient relationships? And then you do the kind of the disintermediation approach. You, you deliver direct, direct uh, to uh, patient uh, information. What effect does that have on provider relationships? It's been looked at in other forums, but it hasn't really been looked at, I think, in one as complicated as genomic medicine. And um, the idea of uh, partnering with participants for both the design and, and, and research design and 
reporting approaches, which isn't really the effects of return of results so much as a kind of overall um, thematic approach to perhaps the eMERGE 4 that is prominently represented in all of us from day one. It was participants as uh, peer level, co-equal um, uh, partners in doing the research. So does that stimulate ideas or rebuttals? <laughs> Uh, Just to try to stimulate a question, in terms of your financial impact on health system and patients, the question that comes up a lot in CSER is, well, what information do third-party insurance companies essentially, what kind, of, what kind of data do they require to approve payment of genomic testing and whether people think that's a goal of eMERGE or not? Yeah, so we, I think we could add uh, impacts on health systems, uh, patient, systems and patients and payers, potentially. We actually did add payers down here in this new, in the last category as well, as a new recipient of eMERGE data. Don't see the other hand. Oh. I guess I'll, I'll uh, since Sharon's intent was to be provocative, I'll, I'll be provoked. Um, uh, I, I, I certainly, I think it's an important thing, and, and this comes up a lot. But the reality is, is that um, we shouldn't tie the success of what we do to whether or not payers pay for something. I mean, it's an unfortunate reality that the decisions that are made relating to payment in this country are, are rarely based on, you know, rational, evidence-based decision making. There's a lot of other factors that are out of our control, not to mention the fact that it's very difficult to engage. There is no one source of truth when it comes to payers. There are thousands of payers. And so while I think it's really important to think about that, the reality is, is that if we can get the healthcare systems and the patients engaged around these questions, as we've um, uh, we've actually done some work, uh, or I've had done some work previously to this when I was in Utah, using business case analyses and these types of things to develop metrics that the administrators and the business people pay attention to, you can actually implement things where it's agnostic to what the payers actually do because they, this is the right thing, and and we can make it a financial argument that this makes sense. So we should have it on there, but I just, I really wouldn't want to tie the success or failure of the program to getting payers to pay for stuff. Okay, point well taken. Uh, yes. So I think there was a suggestion, I think it was from Mark, about encouraging sort of patient-centered data governance and transportability, and I don't Yeah, so I actually put that in the last overall discovery to translation process. Maybe we can move on there, because um, I had, had to sort of uh, on short notice, I was just sticking these under what I thought a reasonable heading was, and I didn't uh, obviously hit them all. Okay. Well, so uh, where, where did you put patient self-phenotyping? Uh, so self-phenotyping uh, was, uh, was in the... Developing apps, I think Marilyn suggested, uh, no, Aaron Grimm suggested developing apps for patient self-phenotyping. Okay, so let's... Okay, well, let me put it in there. Um, so let, was it under data analysis? I, I, I know I didn't type the word self phenotyping. So let's, let's just actually put it under the phenoty better phenotyping methods and I'll just add another bullet here so we have it. And it says, uh, um, there is down here, um, in the last one, let me just go through the, these. Uh, the overall discovery to translation process uh, was, um, uh, we made the observation that eMERGE in a variety of ways is doing doesn't scale. And, and then viewing scaling as its own research problem, incorporating particularly implementation science for principal approaches to scale is um, a, clearly a different um, vector than eMERGE has taken to date. Um, the uh, discovery translation process we've heard repeatedly is critically dependent upon uh, data standards and eMERGE has the opportunity to create new types of uh, standards for new types of genomic um, medicine data objects and things that were particularly called out were the family history, uh, what might be called next gen VCF, a variant uh, call file data formats that would incorporate things such as quality uh, information. 
Uh, importantly, in the discovery translation process, patient-centered data governance uh, versus healthcare institution-centered governance. Um, and uh, here, payers appeared again as engagement of the consortium with new partners, and that included public health agencies. And I, in that same session, we heard payers as potential partners. The general methodology of having small pilot studies particularly for highly novel or disruptive methods, um, partnering with uh, uh, patient groups and other non-traditional organizations such as uh, uh, pharmacies, and uh, uh, participant provided supplemental data for phenotype characterization. That's sort of a subset of self-phenotyping, uh, but the idea that there might be genomic promise measures that could be contributed to the overall promise uh, patient reported uh, measures by this consortium, kind of developed and validated by this consortium. Okay, so that was the end of that, and also the end of my list of notable things, so I clearly must have forgotten something, and Mark remembers it. <laughs> um, well, uh, it's near and dear to my heart, so, but I, I, we've not really captured, I think, the really important point that David Valley made is that, you know, the gift that keeps on giving. How do we use sequence longitudinally over time? Um, that's redundant. How do we use it uh, re recurrently uh, in, the, in the course of the patient event? I didn't see that really captured, and in particular in the CDS discussion, um, you know, the, the point that I brought up about um, using real-time CDS to identify individuals where it would trigger you to go back and look at the sequence for use cases beyond just, well, I'm going to prescribe a drug and is there a pharmacogenomic variant, which is a really banal sort of use case, um, although hard to implement nonetheless. Um, that I think is, is really critical. And ultimately the value proposition, you know, for um, sequencing is going to be having a reliable way to use the sequence over the course of a patient's lifetime. Uh, Zach Kahani published something a few years back saying if you really amortize the cost of the sequence, uh, you know, over a patient's lifetime, it's about 50 cents a year. That's not an unaffordable metric. But if we do things like we always do, which is one-offs, and we have to redo it all the time, now we're now it's a problem. Now there are issues relating to, are we gonna get better at sequencing? Yes, are we gonna update the knowledge? Well, it's difficult. But those are all interesting scientific questions that could be addressed through projects like Emerge. Oh, no. Richard. Yes. Richard. The, the uh, question of the role, changing role of the physician, I didn't see it captured anywhere particularly. I think we saw the data governance patient-centric versus health institution-centric, but that doesn't really express the thought. Yeah, so there, it was um, this effect of standard and non-standard uh, effects of uh, return of results on provider-patient relationships. For me, that's a little too cryptic. So if you'd like to add, add some additional uh, words or clarification to that. How about the role of the physician in? Uh, so. I, I think I would like to generalize that to the role of providers um, since. Right, I think it, Richard, I think is partly addressing and I think maybe it was Gail or I forgot who in one of the introductory comments noted that all results were being given by genetics professionals. Um, and that's different than the patient's physician generally, or at least, and, and so I do think we have a lot of verbiage or word, words up here about really engaging patients more, and we have stuff about the electronic health record, but really how do physicians interact with genetic data for patient care moving forward who are not the genetic specialists, I think is an important issue. Does that capture? Well, actually, that's an additional thought. I mean. There's also the, the route that doesn't involve the physician or the genetics professional. Right. Oh, right. Well, that I think we've tried to capture some of the direct to patients. So. I, I would like to add, add to that and to what you, the point you just made, Sharon. I, I think sitting here listening to the discussion today, the thing that strikes me is how little there seems to be, how little of an effort there seems to be to involve general physicians. I mean, the genetic professionals are going to buy into this. But I think medicine with a capital M, if you want to call it that, 
it, it seems to me that if genomic medicine is really going to work, we have to involve uh, physicians broadly. And um, that's not an easy thing. To, that's a very, very difficult thing to do. I hate, I hate to say it because I'm a physician, but uh, uh, I think uh, innovative ways to, to present the sequence information to them, to show them how the uh, sequence information uh, improves the care that they can offer and um, piques their curiosity, if they have any curiosity left, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is really vital to this, this whole endeavor, from my point of view. Yeah, a point well taken. I think at no point do we actually differentiate that um, uh, the, the level of genomic literacy is highly variable in, in, across clinicians as well, and that we didn't actually incorporate that in our research agenda. Um, yeah, I mean, I th we have to come to them with solutions. You know, we can't come to them with science projects. Uh, and we frequently bring science projects that we think are cool, and they say, I got a lot of stuff to do. I don't have time to do this. <laughs> but if we can actually identify the problems that need to be solved that involves genetics or genomics that they may or may not realize involves genetics or genomics, um, that's where you'll begin to get the buy-in, is when you start solving problems that they're struggling with. Yeah, and I, I would actually just add, since we duplicated provider preferences and patient preferences, and we put health literacy for, for participants and patients, we just need to put health literacy for physicians, too. Yeah. <laughs> it isn't that different, that's true. No, that's the, I think that's a key issue, and you need to be, uh, pr present sort of pragmatic solutions. One, one nice thing, the point was made uh, earlier this afternoon, is by continually, continually engaging the physicians as new connections, new sequence connection bet between their patient and their patient's problems show up, they will be reminded that, you know, that, that pa 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 patients really are different one from another and that this information influences the way people get sick and how they respond and all that kind of stuff. And I would also emphasize some, uh, educating or putting special emphasis on younger physicians. <laughs> you, have, you may have to cut your losses at some point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good point. All right. We're almost to 5 o'clock straight up, which right. would be the sort of normal time an NIH meeting would end. Yeah, yes. but, but you listed this as ending at 5.30, so. Right. Uh, I did. Uh, I well, so, it. We, well, well but I do, I do have a couple of yeah, other yeah. things. Yeah, so there, yeah. We, we have a little bit of time left, Terry. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm not sure where this fits in your, in your rubric, and I, and I really appreciate your doing this. This is really hard to do on the fly. So thank you very much, Dan, for, for pulling this together. Um, somebody had mentioned, it, it might have been Gail, the, the opportunity with the 97% of negative reports that we get. And, and only a few sites are reporting those. Now, partly that's because not all of the sequence, not, not all of the sequence data were verified for the negative reports, but so about half of it was. Um, and that could be very useful clinically. So, so, you know, trying to exploit that might be a useful thing. And I'll let you type that. I have one more. Well, okay, can I, uh, all right. I want to talk can about I react that? to that? Yeah, Because yeah, okay. uh, I didn't during the thing. And, you know, we've, we clearly have made the decision not to return negative results. Uh, I think it's acceptable to put this on the table as, as a, something that would be really good to study. I think that this is a really interesting scientific question about what is the value. I think there's a lot of concern on our part about what does negative really mean. Certainly, what does negative mean if you do 109 genes? And what does negative mean when we have a lot of unanswered questions about how well sequencing performs? And what does negative mean in an indication versus a non-indicated um, test? And so, um, but I think that that's a scientific question that you could uh, develop a methodology to actually answer. And that I think I'd be uh, really interested in as opposed to, and I don't think you were necessarily implying that we should just begin returning it all and, and collect the data, but. Um, and I, I would just remind, we are a research organization and those are important research questions. So, so yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and, and, just to be and, clear, we are returning negative results at Northwestern. And part of the goal there is to understand what you need to do to educate participants to understand that a negative result doesn't mean what it means and what it doesn't mean. And, and I think just like people are pretty comfortable seeing a normal range around any analyte measurement, uh, there's a normal range around whether your uh, genome has told you something or not, but it's an understanding that just because your genome said you don't have a BRCA mutation doesn't mean you're not going to get breast cancer. So 
I, I think it's a really important research question, and I think I think there are some sites in Emerge three that are really tackling that. Well, uh, I, I, I was just going to say we're also talking about the future, right? So we're not we're not trying to reevaluate a prior decision. I think the issues of learning from people who test negative, I think, is an important issue that could be addressed in in Emerge 4 or in the future. Yeah, and I think there were, were a couple of things about uh, family history and family testing. So, so one had to do with you know apps for family history um, and more standardized methods, or at least um, um, you know best practice methods. Uh, another that I thought was really intriguing was was contacting relatives directly rather than trying to go through the relative. Again, that would need to be. I'm glad Mark isn't listening because he'd jump all over that. But anyway, um, uh, you know the the questions that what legal and ethical uh, challenges that raises. There are some healthcare systems that do this and, and outside of this country, and and maybe that's something we should look into. So so the sort of the direct relative contact uh, and um, um, legal implications of. Well, and I think it sort of came up a little bit in the a disruptive discussion, but um, you know, you could imagine a Snapchat equivalent for families that allows you a private way to actually share some of that information. So I think there's some interesting approaches. Well, that's pretty cool. Okay, well, thank you very much. We um, think it was a really effective day and we, we got through quite a busy um, itinerary. Uh, we do have the summary slides um, and, and obviously the slides from each group. I'm sure uh, uh, if you have like some burning thought that did not come up, um, Shethal, should Rong Ling be the source of any other commentary or? or Okay. Yeah, I just want to ask if your, I don't think your slides are confidential, right? Because we webcast, webcast it. <laughs> yeah. So. They were, they're not now. So in that case, in that case, your slides will be posted on the website. Since we have the website for this um, workshop. So if you don't have any objections, we'll posted your slides on website. Well, and also typically after, uh, you know, after these meetings, we write up a, a summary of recommendations and then we send it around to the participants and just ask you to add, um, modify, suggest, you know, et cetera. Um, and we'll hopefully have those in a couple of weeks. Oh, is that two weeks? Two weeks. Two, two or three, three weeks. weeks. Two, two weeks, or yeah. three weeks. Yeah. Soon. No, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Two days. So. <laughs> 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 So I, I think as the, the senior NHGRI person here, I should adjourn us and thank you all very much for coming and for your help with this and uh, we'll keep you posted, so thank you. <laughs>